our second reading, we turn to the Gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 25 to 37, a story I bet you've heard once or a dozen times. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray. <coughs> Gracious God, we come once again and stand before your open word, seeking your words of life, for no other words will do. Parable of the Good Samaritan. You would think I would have a sermon just ready to go on this one. To be honest, so did I. I looked back through my files. <laughs> it seems I have preached on many a text before, but I don't have anything written down on this one. So I dove in this week, studying the text. And I want to start at a good place. I want to start in the beginning with the conversation between Jesus and this lawyer who asks quite a few questions of the rabbi and appears to ask all the wrong questions. We start off with this question of, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now to us, as modern Christians living in America, where the question of individual salvation rings so common from pulpits, this may not seem like a strange question at all. After all, how many of you have been asked the question, when were you saved? A pointed question about our own individual salvation. Salvation separate from those around us. But the challenge is for Jesus and his followers and those in ancient Israel, salvation was not an individual question. It was more about redemption of the entire community. 
To love God and to love neighbor, the commands of the Old Testament that most Jewish teachers claim that all of the law hangs on, Jesus even says this, those are key, but they're not inherently individual actions. They're the actions of a community. The community is the receiver of salvation. The community is what is redeemed. The community is what is responsible for the love of God and the love of neighbor. So the lawyer is focused on something that would not have made sense in the strict way. But then after Jesus says, yes, you, you understand clearly you were paying attention in Sunday school. Love God, love neighbor, well done, go and do that. The lawyer says, well, who is my neighbor? He might as well have said, who is not my neighbor? This effort to set borders around his responsibility, to clarify who is in and who is out, to focus on the boundary issues, is probably not all that unfamiliar for us today. We live in a world that loves to talk about borders and boundaries and who counts and who doesn't. church, broadly, often discusses who needs to be part of our fellowship. Denominations around the world, as this group knows better than most, are being torn apart by questions of boundaries, of borders, of marking lines. Who gets to be a pastor or an elder? or a deacon? Who gets to be married in the church? Who gets to speak? These questions are not just Presbyterian questions, but they're immensely personal for us. During a leadership course in seminary, in the first class, the new president uh, led, someone asked him how we made sense of these boundary issues, how to be faithful leaders with these hard questions. And he had an interesting response. He said, if you think of a circus tent, what is the most important? We all gave him the same look you're giving me. What does a circus tent have anything to do with Christian leadership? He said, if you spend all of your time running around the border of a circus tent, trying to get all the stakes into the ground, and figuring out exactly where the corners are, and the edges are, and the doors are, and paying no attention to the center pole, the tent will never stand. But if you begin with the center and allow it to work outwards, the edges will take care of themselves. I'm not sure his engineering is totally accurate, but I believe his point is. In Al's reading of our first lesson, we hear that Christ is the center of all things, and in him all things hold together. When we ask the question, who is and who is not my neighbor, we are inherently in the land of the boundary question, trying to decide who is deserving of our love and, let's be honest, God's love. But that is not the way of the gospel. The gospel encourages us to keep our faith centered on Christ, the one in whom all things hold together tent pole of the church. So we turn to the parable. It's so well known, it's a cliche. I'm 
I'm sure we've all heard of Good Samaritan laws and all of the things that go with this idea. I know I've heard sermons that focus on the failure of the first two in the story, the priest and the Levite. The traditional teachings of Augustine even extend to comparing the priest and the Levite to the failings of the Jewish people and the failings of the law, and it's Jesus, the Samaritan, who saves the day. As respected as Augustine is, I'm not sure he got this one right. This is not the condemnation of any group of people, and it's also not excusing the behavior of these two men. Often people will say, well, they were worried about becoming ritually unclean, while ignoring the fact that Jewish law commanded you to go to the aid of one who is injured if you were the first on the scene, regardless of how it might affect your ritual purity. Additionally, we're told in the story the men are going down the road. That might just sound like a turn of phrase, but it literally meant down, away from Jerusalem. They're heading away from the temple, the place they would need to be ritually pure for anyway. But that's not Jesus' focus. At the end of the story, Jesus does not say, go and don't be like the first two dopes in the story. Jesus focuses on the example of the Samaritan. A Samaritan who embodies radical, boundary-crossing love and grace. It bears repeating that there was a level of conflict between Jews and Samaritans that was almost to the point of incomprehension for us. The level of animosity that some in our society feel towards those of differing political beliefs this day and age doesn't hold a candle to the conflict between Jews and Samaritans. So for a Samaritan to risk himself for a Jew is radical and unexpected. And make no doubt, to stop and help this man was a risk. For he would have known that the robbers could come back at any moment. To stop and help an injured man took time and money and a direct risk to his own well-being. And yet he does it. And what is Jesus' command? Go and do likewise. How and to who are we commanded to go? Who are the people that you would walk to the other side of the road to avoid. Because I bet for each of us there's someone. Maybe it's someone that you've gotten into a fight with. Maybe it's someone whose political or social views are so divergent from your own friend or family member even that you feel like there's nothing more to talk about. Maybe it's the person you see on the street corner holding out a sign. Someone who's addicted to alcohol, drugs, any number of things. Someone who's in prison Convict? What about an asylum seeker who's tired, dirty, from their long road of fleeing violence? Who do we cross the road to avoid? Remember, if salvation is a community affair, so is this. 
Jesus commands us to give a care and love that is risky and costly and time intensive. It calls for our sacrifice, and our love, and our devotion to not turn our backs. Over the last couple of days, I've been part of a handful of conversations with our leadership and with the General Council of the Presbytery, and in both of those gatherings, we have talked about the crisis on our southern border. I don't have an answer today. If I did, I would be somewhere else trying to make anybody listen to it. But what I do have is a broken heart. And I know there are those in here, because you've talked to me about it, that have a broken heart too. We see people who have fled violence and persecution, who believe in the promise this place here is different, and they find themselves in camps behind barbed wire. If we are to go and do likewise 